ready to have a good time. It's week two of Lucha de Mayo 2022 on the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes the not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. I'm your writer, host, producer, Derek M. Cook, introducing this week with the song Nightshade from the band The Delstroyers, who just had a new album come out called 10,000 Ways to Die. We played a little bit of them last week. I'm playing them again this week because I love the Delstroyers so much. They're based out of Seattle, Washington, and if they ever, ever make it down to the Portland, Oregon, or Vancouver, Washington area, there's a good chance I'm going to try to find a way to go. But, uh... In the meantime, if you're in the Seattle area, they've got some shows coming up later this month as well as next month as well. So go check them out at thedelstroyers.bandcamp.com. That's their website over there on Bandcamp where you can pick up their album. Let them know that you heard about them here on Monster Kid Radio. Welcome to the show, by the way. This week on Monster Kid Radio, did I already introduce myself? I can't remember. I'm not going to go back and listen because I'm really excited about getting this episode out before Friday morning. So, on the off chance I'm repeating myself, my name is Derek Kim Cook, the writer and host producer of the show. This is Lucha de Mayo, where every May, at least up until now, we have been talking about luchador monster movies. And I say that the way that I did because of something that comes up in the conversation that I have in this week's discussion with Kenny from Old Mexico. Kenny is here on the show, not just for his look at Famous Monsters of Filmland, which he also delivers and delivers quite well, but he's actually the host, the host, the guest, the co-host, the, the main guest. He's the luchador dude bringing some blue demon fun to the show this week because he and I are going to talk about a blue demon monster movie. Is it a monster movie? I guess it's a monster movie. It's Blue Demon Los Diabolicus. Blue Demon Contra Los Diabolicus. You know what? If you saw it in the show notes, that, that's what I'm trying to say. I do not speak, and I especially do not read Spanish, so I'm just going to tell you it's a Blue Demon movie with some di- diabolic in it. It's good. It's a good time. Actually, I had so much fun discussing this movie. I had almost as much fun discussing the movie as I did watching the movie. Sometimes I try to trim this back in the edits of the conversations that I have on the show. Sometimes I try real hard to cut back on my laughter because really, are you downloading a podcast to listen to me laugh for an hour? I I hope not. But (laughs) in this case, I couldn't help it. I had so much fun with this movie. Or as Kenny will try to tell you, we had so much divertido with this movie (laughs) that... I couldn't help it. I just had a really good time. I came to some decisions about my fandom regarding luchador monster movies and luchador movies in general after having watched this movie and having discussed it with Kenny. And yeah, we may even see a change to how things are done for Lucha de Mayo here on Monster Kid Radio in the future as a result of this. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We've got that. We've got the look at famous monsters of Filmland. And of course, we've got the Beta Capsule Review this week with Mark Matsky taking a look at another episode of Ultra 7. 7. <clears throat> okay, I'm not going to sing it this time. Ultra 7. You know, he's going through the entire Ultraman saga episode by episode, and it's amazing. I thank him for it. I think you're going to dig it. In fact, I'm so excited that you're going to dig it. We're just going to dig it together right now. Live from the Land of Light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty Ultra Heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. After a routine skydiving training session goes awry, Soga and Amagi must escape from Dimension X in the 18th episode of Ultra 7. When Soga prompts a nervous Amagi to jump from the training plane, the two Ultra Guard members fall through what appears to be a normal cloud. However, when they fail to show up at the rendezvous point, the Terrestrial Defense Force mounts a search that does not yield the missing crew. Meanwhile, Amagi finds himself in a strange, deadly forest where giant tick-like bugs attach themselves to his body, 
and the sound of a strange bell announces the appearance of a giant alien. Amagi manages to avoid the creature, locating Soga thrashing around in a swamp, but their reunion is interrupted by the appearance of a gas-spewing chimera that is equal parts spider and crab that is disposed of by Soga's marksmanship. Meanwhile, the Ultra Guard hypothesizes that Amagi and Soga are trapped in pseudo-space, a phenomena that had been noted on previous occasions, but all attempts to locate it, much less explore it, had ended in failure. That doesn't stop Captain Kiriyama and company from boarding the Ultra Hawk in order to rescue their comrades, and they're soon flying into a cloud just like the one that swallowed Amagi and Soga. Episode 18 of Ultra 7 demonstrates the careful way that the production team developed characters while also playing with audience expectations. Amagi's aversion to parachuting is understandable, yet he emerges as brave and wise. We also learn more about Anne, who was willing to search a collapsing dimension to look for Dan. The show keeps viewers guessing, rewarding fans of kaiju combat with more Ultra 7 than we've seen in some time, and a remarkably staged final battle. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Matsky reporting. Traps in a whirlpool of shrieking fear. From the most fiendish idea ever conceived by the human brain. The brainiac. And it has a friend. She was beautiful, desirable, and not altogether human. The curse of the crying women. Together they will trap you in a world of horror. But if you live through it, <laughs> you will never forget. The Brainiac and the Curse of the Crying Women. I am Dr. Lee Cushing. Welcome to my Chamber of Horrors. Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors is a monster rally novel in the tradition of the classic Universal and Hammer horror film. It's written by Stephen D. Sullivan, the award-winning author of White Zombie, Daikaiju Attack, Manos the Hands of Fate, and one of the creators of the original chill role-playing game. This book recreates the thrills of the classic monster vs. monster film. We've got vampires, werewolves, mummies, psychic twins, scheming madmen, Plenty of unexpected chills. Now you can get Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors in print or for Kindle at Amazon.com and other fine retailers. Coming soon in other ebook formats. Find out more at CushingHorrors.com or SDSullivan.com and support Steve's work through Patreon at HeySteve.com. I do hope you've enjoyed your visit. Please come again and remember the chamber is always waiting for its next victim. Here he is. Watch out. For here is a superhuman with the strength of a hundred men. No one and nothing seems able to stop him. Invincible, invulnerable. Argo Man, the fantastic Superman. But even he had his Achilles heel, a beautiful woman's kiss. Kill each other, kill each other. Man, the fantastic Superman. Kill each other.
A man gifted with such extraordinary powers that ordinary men were helpless to cope with him. Everyone and everything was pitted against him, from hired killers to the most diabolical inventions of modern science. The world's most beautiful women vied for his favors, or the chance to kill him. each other. Argo Man, the fantastic Superman. picture which will take you on a journey out of time, carry you on a crest of thrills and laughter from start to finish. Be sure to see this Superman power. Don't miss it. Hello there, Monster Kid Radio heads. This is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. Today we continue our Lucha de Mayo with Part 2 of Mexi Creatures from 1964's Issue 29. We will hear about Mexican vampires, early luchador movies, and a film you can watch with Derek this coming Saturday. Let's get started with the first section entitled, The Undead Get Fed. Vampires, in Mexi movies, are as numerous as fleas in an abominable snowman's fur. Sample titles are The Vampire El Vampiro The Vampire's Coffin El Ataúd del Vampiro The Invasion of the Vampires La Invasión de los Vampiros The World of the Vampires El Mundo de los Vampiros And The Saint vs. the Vampire Women Santo contra las Mujeres Vampiro The Dracula-like role in The Vampire and its sequel The Vampire's Coffin is played by German Robles which isn't pronounced the way it looks. In Spanish the letter G has an H sound, so think of the thirsty count as being played by Herman Robles. Robles is quite active in Mexi monster movies, as is Abel Salazar, who appears at the other end of the stake in the vampire's coffin. Though Robles was destroyed in the approved Van Helsing manner in the vampire, the job had to be done all over again in the vampire's coffin because the stake was removed by some square who hadn't been around enough vampire movies to know you can't pull up stakes without getting a bit part. In the world of the vampires, it seems a colony of the undead is living in the spooky dark basement of an old Hacienda house. The vampires and their leader are seeking revenge on the last survivors of a family that did them dirt about a century ago in the past. Talk about holding grudges. After mucho struggles, the vampires again bite the dust. Black Mask Neutron Neutron El Enmascarado Negro has as its title character a comic book type hero so common in our own serials. Neutron's opponent is Dr. Caronte, who with his human robots is out to obtain the formula for the neutron bomb so that he can rule the world. The Robots of Death Los Automatas de la Muerte has the same characters and practically the same plot. In this variation Dr. Caronte uses human blood to nourish a master brain created with the brains of three dead scientists. The object is again to obtain the neutron bomb. Neutron vs. Dr. Caronte Neutron contra el Dr. Caronte is another film in this series, which goes on and on like Dr. Mabuse of German fame. In The Man and the Monster El Hombre y el Monstruo A pianist has sold his soul to the devil, a theme quite common in Mexican films. In exchange for his soul, the pianist has gained the ability to play music of unearthly beauty. The catch is, when he plays, he turns into a monster. This somewhat limits his concert appearances. To make matters worse, the music is so powerful he cannot resist playing it. In a scene somewhat remindful of a part of Frankenstein, the pianist is drawn by the sound of a piano to a little girl practicing her lesson. He tries to help her but when he plays he loses his mind and becomes the monster. That is all for this week's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We will have more next time 
For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. horror of the dead, entombed for 200 years that creeps its way back to terrorize the living. The terrifying horror of a dreaded man called Dr. Terror who, with his deck of mystic cards, could foretell destiny. Dr. Terror's House of Horrors. Completed link up accomplished successfully, starting rocket motors to continue flight over and out. Next step, Mars. 35 million miles away. Mission Mars. Three astronauts on a mission to the forbidden reaches of a red planet, defying the elements, inviting death and disaster. Darren McGavin, who gambled his life on a fantastic mission to a world no other living man had ever seen. Oh, darling, I'm so scared. Nick Adams, who shared the incredible odyssey, living an adventure beyond his wildest dreams. Mission Mars. What the hell is that? They met their destiny on a planet that time forgot. An adventure that smashes the barriers of man's imagination. Watch out, the ball is opening! Help me! Mission, Mission Mars. 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 This is Count Dracula, and I'm here to offer you a friendly warning. Derek and his guests often get excited, and occasionally this results in revealing key plot points of the movies they're discussing. You know how the children of the night, ah, I mean monster kids, can get sometimes. So consider yourself warned. And don't come begging to me to kill them for their transgressions afterward. I have more pressing issues to take care of, like that pesky Van Helsing. Well, ladies and gentlemen and everybody else, you know we can't have Lucha de Mayo without having Kenny from Mexico on the show preaching the gospel of Blue Demon. So we got a Blue Demon movie on deck this week, and I'm super excited uh, even though uh, I was a little hesitant going into it because there was no subtitle, there was no dub track, I relied on the mastery and the generosity of Kenny, who provided <laughs> a, a kind of a dub, kind of a commentary. Either way, it was enough for me to get the story, and I'm excited to talk about it with Kenny. We haven't had Kenny on the show in a long time like this, so welcome back to the show, sir. Yeah, it's great. Great to be back, and I'm excited to talk about yet another Blue Demon movie. And just for new people and for us mem memory challenged, um, about eight years ago, I actually met Blue Demon Jr. And one of the questions I asked him at that time was, what, was, what do you think is the best movie that your dad did? And he mentioned a one of the pair-ups with Santo, and it was actually the one they showed that weekend at the monster bash and i was like really because blue demon didn't really do much in the movie he was kind of made into a zombie and didn't have any 
many lines and everything. I said, no, that can't be his best movie. I want to see all of his solo movies and see if there's really a better movie. So that's what we've been doing. This is our fourth one, I think, that we're doing today. And um, I'm excited to, to go through it. Um, and like we always say, um, it's a lot of fun. But today we're gonna. <laughs> today I'm gonna teach you the Mexican word divertido, divertido. Okay, so it's divertido. So we don't have to say fun all the time. <laughs> so I'm gonna say fun because I can't roll my R's. But uh, I'm gonna take that clip of you saying that. And I'm just gonna use that from now. I just. <laughs> Yep. So, uh, so today, what I've done, what I've done today, to you know, you know me, I always like to like with my uh, famous monster segments. For those who don't know, mm -hmm. I am uh, Kenny from the famous uh, look at famous monsters. Totally rocking Kenny, according to the uh, uh, <laughs> to our favorite Darcy uh, the male girl. Darcy the male yeah. girl. Yeah, I was I was thinking of the other thing that she used to do in Be Beaverton, but I didn't really want to say that. So, <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, Kenny. <laughs> I know. I've, oh. I've, I've never seen her do that. I've only seen her as the male girl. But um, anyway, uh -huh. but uh, so <laughs> I'm Kenny, and I like to, I like to kind of uh, I like to kind of blend things together. Make you know, I don't just make a. I don't like making a segment of the famous monster segment that doesn't talk about the movie you're talking about. So I'm the first right. one on top of you saying, "What's the next movie?" And when you say. Uh, at the end of the show, I don't know what I'm doing next week. I'm like, oh, I want to know. <laughs> I know you've been so, you are so patient with me with that, man. I, I'm really lucky, You're very patient with me with that. So thank you. <laughs> but anyways, I said, no, I'm going to do this. I did this before with when we did a Harryhausen special, and I'm going to do the same thing with this movie. Uh, we're going to go. Blue Demon meets the Classic Five. The Classic Five. The Classic Five. Nice. So we're going to have uh, several things, five of each thing, talking about this movie. And my, my hope, maybe you probably the people will probably get some spoilers going, of course, but they're not going to really under, maybe not understand now all the story, but they're going to be excited about checking this movie out. It's, it might be hard to find. Uh, that uh, I couldn't find a really good print online. But uh, but it is available from you know different places if you look for it and want to purchase it or whatever. But uh, and today's movie is Blue Demon contra las Diabolicas. And that's... under normal circumstances, I'd play the trailer here, but uh, yeah, um, <laughs> no trailers. <laughs> But <laughs> you get the music. Ba, 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 da, oh, I love the music. Are you kidding me? This music was awesome. Yeah, that's a great idea. Play some music here, Derek, in the future when you edit this episode. This music was fantastic. Yes. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. So first of all, let's go into the classic five Mexican actors that we find in this movie. So let's get a little background a bit about okay. some of the people we're going to see today. Course number one is Blue Demon himself. This is his eighth film, his seventh solo film, where he was by himself as the star, as the main wrestler, and um, it was his name in the title. So it was his seventh film that he did one film before where he was um, in the mix of wrestlers and not the headliner. But this is his seventh headlining film, made in 1967-68, and. Um, and so he's the big star and the reason we're watching this movie. But I want to talk about some of the other people. Number two on the list is a guy named David Reynoso. Now, if you guys remember, we did the Infernal Brains. And mm -hmm. he was in that. He played the same character. And like you, when, I, when you started watching the movie, you said, this movie seems really familiar. And it does have a lot of familiar elements from Infernal Brains. Some of the same stars, some of the same, the same nightclub, some of the same elements. But uh, it's 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 different. But anyways, David Reynoso, uh, he made 119 films. Very prolific, very big star um, wow. in Mexico. Well known name. When you when I saw him in the Infernal Brains, it's like I know that guy, and um, I, I had seen him before. And uh, so he's been in a lot of movies. And he made one American movie in 1985, and that movie was called Stick. And it was directed by Burt Reynolds. 
And it starred, of course, Burt Reynolds, Candace Bergen, and George Siegel. So that's a 70s I, cast, if you've ever heard wow. of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course, uh, but it wasn't the 70s. Wow. It was 1985. Is stick. The mob took his money, killed his best friend, then set him up as the fall guy. I want him to take it. Play around with those people. You're going to get hurt. They're playing a deadly game. He owes me $5,000. And he's not about to be the loser. Because if you get him mad, you can be sure of one thing. Give me a hand! He's going to get even. Uh, my friend Leonard Malton gave it one and a half stars and said it was totally boring. But, uh, but I'd never heard of it before, but... He- uh, Mr. Reynoso was in that, but all the rest of his movies were Mexican movies. He played detectives, uh, singing cowboy type movies as well, and a handful of uh, luchador and monster movies as well. Okay. The other big star is Anna Martin, and she plays uh, David Reynoso's girlfriend, even though she is twenty years younger than he is. She was Miss <laughs> she was Miss Mexico in nineteen sixty three, and then when she went to London for the Miss World competition. She got disqualified because she was only 17 years old. And she had to be 18. Um, she also appeared in just one American film, and that was a Western. And that starred Robert Taylor when he was in the end of his career and Chad Everett when he was starting his career. Now, you might not know Chad Everett. He was a big TV star in the 70s. I think he was in a, a show called Medical Center. So I knew about him. This was in 1967. The film was never released to the theater, so it went right to TV. Some people that I reviews I saw said it was pretty good. It should have been in the theaters. Return of the Gunfighter. Whiplash fury. Blasting loose as unleashed murderers fire their way into a cattle empire. Storming its riches. And its women. Igniting the Southwest into a searing inferno until a blazing land cried aloud for Return of the Gunfighter. Yeah! And we have a couple wrestlers. One that I instantly recognized because he was uh, one of the uh, wrestlers in what my favorite Santa movie, Santa versus a Martian Invasion, and that is Nathaniel Leon, and his stage name was Frankenstein. So he's the bald guy in the movie, and um, he had a pretty good role in this. He had a couple good fights, and um, he was one of the henchmen, and um, he had a pretty pretty solid role. And here's I read I found this about him. It says Nathaniel was known as Frankenstein because of him being so tall and having such a sinister face with those scary and huge eyebrows. He played the stereotypical villain in many movies. Though during his career, he also showed that he could comfortably play comedy roles. Even with those looks, everybody agrees that in real life, he was a humble and polite man. So that's Frankenstein, the bald wrestler. He okay. made 71 movies from wow. 1960 through 1989. Now, his wrestling career, he wasn't very successful as a wrestler, though he wrestled during that time. But because of his looks, he was very popular to put in the movies. Okay. Okay. Another interesting person, <clears throat> and this is our first kind of spoiler of the movie, um, he plays one of the henchmen, but he's also uh, someone who's, uh, well, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but he has a major part in the movie. He wears a mask as well. His name is Fernando Oses, and he acted in 44 films, 24 of them were Santo films. So he was in a lot of Santo films. Okay. And he also wrote screenplays. And he was a co writer of this particular film, as oh. well as another Santo film, Santo Meets Frankenstein's Daughter, which I found on Tubi today. And it has a beautiful print on Tubi dubbed. I think it's probably maybe from that that set that they've been releasing. Yeah, I've you know been okay. Yeah, where there's yeah, yeah, two yeah. two dub films, so it's dubbed, 
and it's beautiful print on Tubi. If people want to catch that. Frankenstein meets Fran- uh, Santo meets Frankenstein's daughter, and that ha- that was written by Fernando Osas. He doesn't play in the movie. He's the writer, the the sole writer of that movie. So um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, so those are the five, the classic five actors. Okay. Fascinating. Okay. So let's get into the movie itself. Classic <laughs> five cinematic elements that make this film divertido. Fun. Okay. <laughs> so the first thing, you mentioned it already, the music. Oh, I loved it. I loved it so much. <laughs> you got that jazzy, that rocky, jazzy oh. 60s. Oh, it's just, it's wonderful. And of course, we have the the opening, which looks like a cross between uh, a cheap James Bond movie and what you would see on the mud flaps of eighteen wheelers, uh, with <laughs> these little silhouettes. But they um, they were pretty racy <clears throat> for just being silhouettes and uh, little silhouettes of Blue Demon and stuff. And this wonderful That's what's on the, music the movie theme. poster. Yep. Yeah, it's what's the yeah, end, which uh, I put on a T-shirt that. Kenny made a comment about how he doesn't think his wife will let him buy it. So, yeah, you know, just saying. So, anyways, and that, and then, but <laughs> then it's not only the the soundtrack, but we have a musical group, El Clan, with spelled with the non P C K K L A N, and they are a like a, a Mexican jazz uh, rock jazz band from the '60s. Um, they were a real group that had records and everything. And they do actually do three songs near the beginning of the film. So this is like a musical at first. <clears throat> yeah. Have music. And of course, included with that music is our second number two cinematic elements that make this film divertido. There's dancing. Yeah. There's a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have dancing. And what we see in this film, the film is called Diabolicas, which means the diabolic women. And the Diabolicas are actually dancers slash wrestlers, okay? So um, in the beginning of the film, we see them dancing, first of all. So that's uh, one of the things that we have. Again, at the beginning of the movie, we have some music and dancing. Now, the major part of this movie, the major body of this movie, is a famous type genre, uh, a subgenre of film noir the heist procedural okay what's mm-hmm. that i think of movies like stanley kubrick's the killing um the famous asphalt jungle which i think was directed by john houston and uh, a famous french film Pepe la Moco, where basically the idea is they're showing you how they're going to commit a crime and they're showing you the commission of the crime so that this movie follows that film noir tradition and we have a lot of heist procedural. This is about diamond smugglers. And we see how they steal the diamonds. We see how they switch them up, how they get them from Mexico into New York. And so that's a big part of this movie. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Another genre, another aspect, the fourth thing that makes this a fun movie is it's a mystery. Mm-hmm. Because when it starts, what happens? The first thing that we see, a girl gets her bag stolen. And then Blue Demon comes in and breaks her neck. <laughs> what are you doing, man? What a, what a shock! And the mystery begins from the very beginning. And that's why they had to throw three musical numbers right in a row to get your heartbeat down after that incredibly shocking beginning. And that's <laughs> the mystery of the movie. How could it be that Blue Demon killed these women? And and who actually did the killing? And and who is this strange, this strange person, this masked person, uh, dressed all in black? We never see the face with a peculiar voice. That's what Anna Martin said. She has a pe- he. I mean, ah, I gave it away. It has a peculiar voice, and that's another mystery. There's a lot of mystery in this movie, and it makes that. Part of that fun. And of course, number mm-hmm. five on our list, classic five cinematic elements that make this film fun, Dervitido, is the wrestling. 
Oh, there's some good wrestling. In this. It's good. Some very good wrestling. Um, we got some uh, and uh, very athletic. The first match, women, three against three. They called it Australian tag team match, and um, and it was quite well done. Now the funny thing about the wrestling, the women wrestling match, apparently you know they are the same girls who were dancing at the beginning, but when they're wrestling, their body types kind of change. <laughs> <laughs> so just just a little bit. <laughs> so I think I think they use stunt women to do the actual wrestling, or not actual wrestlers. They had dancers for the dancing, wrestlers for the wrestling, but for the movie they were all, all the same girls. Okay, so they are the diabolics. So those are the five things: music, dancing, heist, procedural, mystery, and wrestling. Perfect for ninety minutes, of fun and entertainment. Yeah, and before you move on to another classic five thing, uh, I'm going to say again, I love the music. I love, love, love the music. This is probably one of my favorite uh, soundtracks, I guess, from these movies uh, ever that I've experienced. Uh, which, and this is one that I purposely stayed away from because, you know, I I like my subtitles. I want to know what's going on. And then when you brought it up, it's like, okay, I'm going to wait until right before. And, and like you know, I watched this this morning before work so uh, it's very fresh in my mind i loved this music so much the music adds to this kind of batman-esque kind of vibe which i don't know i, I review i saw your notes earlier i don't know if you're gonna mention that or not but i'll sit on it in case you do bring it up later but there's this batman-esque vibe to this whole thing and then the wrestling and i talked about this on the episode that i recorded with robert kelly which actually went out last week by the time y'all are hearing this now but Kenny hasn't heard it because the episode hasn't gone out yet, uh, that a lot of times, and I think I've said it in the past before, with a lot of these movies, the only way for people to see a real wrestling match in Mexico was to see it in the films. People didn't have television. People didn't have arenas to go to in some of the smaller rural communities. But they had movie theaters. So this is where you get to see some real wrestling matches. And a lot of times it's a real wrestling match that gets lifted out of whatever card or, or event and repurposed for the film and kind of inserted in like the movie last week and then this week i don't think that's the case i think some of this was actually shot specifically for the film because the editing and you brought this up in the commentary information that you sent me the editing is so cinematic the placement of the camera is so they get in the ring you don't see cameras get in the ring in most wrestling matches <laughs> but in in these films last week and this week the camera doesn't shy away from getting in uh, in on the action and it really kind of added uh, a dynamic sense of excitement and action to what was going on that i don't see in all the luchador movies that i watch i love them but this one ooh, this one and the one we did last week with robert kelly the wrestling stuff is just top notch man really good stuff and and that's that leads it in well to my next uh topic for today um the question is the director. The director is Chano Uriata. Chano Uriata. Okay. And my question is genius or hack? Genius or hack? <laughs> Five classic and not so classic moments to help you decide. All right. Now, just okay. before we get into that, just to give you an idea, uh, Chano Uriata was, again, a very prolific filmmaker in Mexico. He made 99 films. And those include the famous Brainiac, The Living Head, and four Blue Demon movies. As you go through his list of movies, you see most of those movies are the uh, the Singing Cowboy, the uh, Ranchero films, mainly those type. But he did all kinds of movies as well, some uh, detective movies, all, all different kinds. But the most famous one, of course, Brainiac. Everyone out there should know about that one. Crazy movie. Mm -hmm. But... This movie kind of had varying degrees of brilliance and hackery. So okay. no, number one for me to hack, there's one dance sequence. And I just didn't get it. They had some, uh, you know, they showed the girl dancing at first. And it was kind of a slower number. And then he put the camera behind like these Mardi Gras beads and this weird kind of ball. And the dancing's happening like way in the distance. 
And I always like, you know, when I did camera work on TV and stuff, I always looked for to have something in the foreground to kind of give it a depth to. But this was sure. like, this is really goofy looking. And it was like, what do you, what is really, really out of focus because it's so close to the camera, the decoration. And the, the answer was so far away, it just didn't make any sense. But then later on in the movie, there's a fight. And that fight's between the wrestler Frankenstein and Blue Demon. They're in an office. And I just, and I saw there was that foreground aspect that I like. And he did it well. Because mm-hmm. he had the camera on a low angle. There was like a table before the right bit in front of them as they were wrestling. And, and you could see the ceiling. That was a cool shot. Yeah. So there was that combination of what's this deal with this dance? And then, oh, man, that guy's a genius. I love the placement of the camera. Another genius thing, and we talked about this a little bit already, is the competent wrestling editing. Yes. Uh, my, th- my third watch of this, I, I started getting more into the details. And I really started to notice, like you were noticing how they were getting into the action. The editing was not sloppy. They were edited on the action. So in other words, mm-hmm. when if they were swinging down and then they would cut, they would cut in the middle of the action. So, and that's a, a very uh, standard way that they teach mm-hmm. the editing that a lot of people don't know and they don't do, but it makes the editing seem smooth. It makes it like there's not this jump cut aspect to it. It seems like what I felt like, like you were saying, it's, it has like a reality, a cinematic quality, but at the same time, because everything kind of mixed together. You felt like they were filming it live on tape because the action flowed. But like you were saying, they're in the ring at times. So it wasn't, they had to have done it at different times. They might've had two cameras and then put those together, but sometimes they were in the ring. And so uh, that was, I thought was very well done. The editing and the wrestling. So number four is the hack. In the same wrestling at the end, I'm going to give a big spoiler here. There is a Blue Demon imposter. Of course, we mm-hmm. mentioned that Blue Demon killed a woman at the beginning. We find out later, spoiler alert, that it was actually an imposter. Well, in the end, they somehow it's set up so that they have a wrestling match together. And the problem they had with this is in the editing is they said, here's the Blue Demon. Okay, and they and they had him like in the right hand side of the screen looking in. So it was like he was on the right corner. And then they said, and here's uh, the wrestler X. Mm -hmm. And he was like facing in the same corner, facing the same direction. I was like, what's the deal? They they should have put it on the opposite side or made it look like they're at opposite ends. That's his two people. But if you look at that scene closely, you'll see it's like they cut and it's like blue deep. It's almost looks like a jump cut because it's like the same spot. And it was hmm. that was really bad. And it was surprisingly okay. bad to me as I was watching it with a detailed look at it. It's like that is really bad. Why, why did they do it that way? When you see some things are good, some things are bad. So number five, I'm going to let you decide. Is it a genius or a hack? One of the main features of this film, and whether it was a directorial thing or what, but I got a kick out of it. Some people might think it's corny. Genius or hack, every time Lou Demon entered a room, he jumped through a window. <laughs> every time he left a room, he jumped out the window. I love that so much. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> it was so great. <laughs> Genius oh. move, was it? I'd like to have seen the... The, I'd like to have been in the meeting when they decided to do that, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, Blue. It's going to be really boring if you just walk into the room. Why don't you jump through the window? Eh, I could do that, oh. you know. It's like. <laughs> oh, man. I, You know, it's. Uh, you know, we talk about these movies and, and kind of liken them to like the superhero. These are the superheroes of the people, right? Mm-hmm. And. and I think back to the the George Reeves Superman TV show. He's always jumping in out of windows and scenes. <laughs> so let's have Blue Demon do it. Yeah. There's there's some stuff in here. There's a shot where he's climbing up 
the side of a building with a grappling hook straight out of the Batman TV show. It's it's wonderful. I loved it. All they needed there was Canton Floss to come out the window and start t- talking to him. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, man. So, yeah. So, no, I loved it. Because, hmm. you know, the first time you're like, okay, yeah, I get it. But it it's a thing. It, it can do it. <laughs> he, kept, he kept doing it. If there, was a, if there was a way to get an ability, he was going to find the window to do it. You know, so. Right, right. Oh, I loved it. So... <laughs> So my last notes, uh-huh. the classic five wild and wacky moments to tickle your funny bone. So Uh-oh. the fun thing about these movies is uh, perhaps intentionally or not intentionally, they pack a few laughs with some of the stuff that goes on. Sure. And, sure. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's, that's what, that's what brings some of the joy into, to watching these if you try to take it too seriously, and it, sometimes it does take itself pretty seriously, there's some, you know, uh, you know, with the crime and things that's going on, but um, some of it is is funny. So on number five, <laughs> I'm going to go for the countdown here. Number five, um, I, I got a kick out of part of the heist aspect of it, the old suitcase switch trick. Okay, <laughs> so let me paint the picture for those who haven't seen the movie yet. So this is early in the movie. Uh, part of the plan to smuggle the diamonds is they sew the diamonds into women's clothes, and then they they give them to the diabolic girls, and they go to the United States to wrestle and dance, and they take that in their clothes. Supposedly they don't know. Some of them do. Some of them don't. Watch the movie. That's part of the mystery. Well, anyways... So this guy goes in, and he has a bag, and it's I had my family had bags just like this. It was like oh, it was like a memory uh, jostler because oh, we had, I had a bag like that. I love those bags. They're like a plaid bag, and it has a zipper, and you it's like on the side of the bag, you open it, and it's like a flap, and you put this clothes in, right? And it was a <laughs> and it was exactly like the ones we had: blue, uh, green stripes on a black background. The guy brings the bag in to the dressing room while the girls are wrestling. And the girl happens to have the same type of bag, exactly the same bag, right? Now, logic would dictate, logic would dictate that he would take her bag and replace it with the other bag. They're exactly the same, right? No. Here's what he does. He opens the girl's bag, takes her clothes out of the bag, opens his bag, takes the diamond laced clothes out of his bag. They look totally different from her clothes and sticks them into her bag. Then he takes the clothes he took out of her bag and puts them in his bag and walks out. I thought, why? 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 (laughs) Again, watching it two or three times, maybe too much, but it's fun. So there's this guy. All he had to do was switch the bags. He did this clothes switch. It added another two and a half minutes to the movie. Heist, heist. We're seeing how they did it. They're, they're how their brains work. In this case, not very well. Number four. <laughs> the mm-hmm. old, hey, someone is behind you with a gun trick. <laughs> <laughs> See, that only works when your adversary has taken way too many headshots during his career. <laughs> yeah. That's oh, man. <laughs> so, Blue Demon is... In the office, he's looking for stuff. We don't really know why yet. And he and he hides in the closet. And the henchman, Frankenstein, comes in. And he notices and sees that something is in the closet. And so he goes to the closet and says, Come on out. Put your hands up or I'm going to shoot you. So Blue Demon obeys, comes out with his hands up. And then Blue Demon says, Oh, you think you're smart? Well, you don't notice the guy behind you who has a gun at your back. What does Frankenstein do? Turn around and looks for the guy <laughs> with a gun. Of course, there was nobody. And boom, the fight starts. Knocks the gun out of his hand. And we have a nice little office-bound wrestling match. <laughs> Funny. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, I'm tearing up, dude. <laughs> I, so Kenny and I are doing this on Skype through videos, you know, through video chat, because 
you know, I like to, whenever I have Kenny on the show, I like to put the video camera on because he's in his man cave with all sorts of cool monster and, and movie stuff up behind him. So I get, to, I get to check that out, including the ceiling, ladies and gentlemen. He he does not waste space. So I don't know if you can see this, Kenny, but I'm tearing up laughing about this because <laughs> it's, it's pretty over the top, but it, it makes perfect sense for this movie in its own weird warped logic kind of way. And I loved it so much. Hey, by the way, what about the guy behind you? Huh? And the, no. It's like, dude, what do you know? And then uh, after it's all done, <laughs> his boss comes in and and no. insults him with the perfect word, imbecile. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same in Spanish and English, so you don't need a translation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number oh. three on our countdown. Yeah. The old, uh, classic wild and wacky moments that tickle your funny bone. We talked a little bit about this already. Bat Demon. Bat Demon. Dude. Uh, we got, <laughs> we've got the motorcycle. Not so fancy, but he has nice utilities in there. He happens uh-huh. to have a grappling hook. Perfect. And he also sure. has some cool, like a little microphone. You know, he stuck in his ear and he lowered it down. He just happened to have that. He doesn't have a utility belt. Who knows where he was keeping that thing? But he had just lowers oh. that down. He must, <laughs> he must have some pockets in his cape or something. Lowers he's that thing down. Gotta be. And then later on, he's he's there. It's almost like he has a cell phone because he's like <laughs> he's out in the country and he's talking. It's like a ham radio setup, you know. And they're using all these ham radio codes and stuff. So I think. Channel Arietta or the screenwriters were ham radio fans because they're throwing out all these code words and stuff that no one's going to understand, even Spanish or American. And then, of course, we have the famous climbing up the wall. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Do you think it was done Batman style or did he really climb up that wall? Oh, come on. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm pretty I, sure. I, I doubt it. Well, you I know doubt what? it because I when he got that. up to the top, he was really sweaty. You look like he, you know. <laughs> take a look at it again, and 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 it almost made me feel like he. They they said we don't want to build a whole set and have a wall on the ground. We have a wall right here. Do you do it blue? Of course I will. Take a look. The cape looks like it's really falling. It's not being tugged. Take a look. Closer look. I think he actually you know, climbed the wall. You know I. It, I, I think I might have jumped to the conclusion way too quick, knowing how Adam West and you know them did it in the uh, you know the Batman TV show. But they were actors; they weren't wrestlers; they weren't <laughs> athletes. I, you know, no disparaging Adam West and company. Never met the man. Not saying anything negative, but I don't think he could have done that on the regular basis, you know, that easily. And would would they have even let him do it for television? But this is a wrestler who gets in the ring and swings chairs around and takes devastating blows and uses his head as a weapon. So, yeah, of course he did it. That makes perfect sense. I I really think he did. So uh, I'll have to watch it again and clear up my doubts. (laughs) Rats. Uh, I I am going to watch this again. So, yeah, no, (laughs) no, no fear there. Okay. Number two on the countdown. Classic five wild and wacky moments to tickle your funny bone. The not so superhero foiled <laughs> by a flat tire. Okay, so uh-huh. here's the story, folks. Blue Demon climbed up a wall. He's spying on the bad guys. They're talking about their next uh, heist that they're going to do. And he calls the police, says, I know where they're going. Don't worry, I'll take care of them. Gets on his motorcycle, driving on the road. <laughs> a popping sound. He drives off the road, gets off of his motorcycle, and says the words, Maldita Yanta, which means damn tire. <laughs> and he, he had a flat tire, which, have we, have we ever seen that before? I mean, this guy is supposedly modeling Batman, <laughs> which was popular in Mexico, too. It, they're modeling the super spy movies. And he's done in by bad Mexican roads. Is that a political commentary? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I thought that was kind of funny and humorous that he would uh, be foiled by that. 
And um, it kind of you you kind of think, oh wow, he's gonna go, and we're gonna have a big fight at a jewel store and jewelry store and all this, and he's gonna he's gonna <laughs> finally get him. And he stopped because he got a flat tire on his motorcycle, and he didn't have a spare. How he got back to where he had to got back is not shown, so we don't really know. Was he? Did he have to hitchhike? <laughs> Probably. Ah, yeah. <laughs> would yeah, you Would you yeah. pick up a masked wrestler on the road? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about you folks. I would in a hot minute. I, I don't, it doesn't, yeah. Is that a luchador with his thumb out? Hop in, pal. We're going for a ride. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh. <laughs> All right. So now the last, number one, classic five wild and wacky moment to tickle your funny bone. Uh huh. The great final air quotes, battle. <laughs> okay, folks, d d again, huge spoiler here. Hopefully by the time you find it and see it, you'll have forgotten all the spoilers because you have to <laughs> be able to enjoy the mystery. But during the whole movie, we've been seeing the big boss. They've been mm -hmm. calling it sir the whole movie, senor, senor, senor. It looks like a man from the back. But in the end of the movie... This blue demon finally confronts the big boss. And he goes, who are you behind that mask? And, I said, and it says, uh, you'll never know. He says, I make a living out of demasking people. He reaches out and grabs the mask. And who is it? Nora, one of the diabolics. In fact, she was the feature dancer at the first dance. If you remember my commentary, She's wearing mm -hmm. the black dress. So if you watch this movie, yep. she, look at the black dress girl at the beginning. She's the bad girl. Major spoiler. Anyways, so what's going to happen is Blue Demon, a muscular man wrestler in the 1960s, going to beat up the big boss who turns out to be a woman. <laughs> she pulls out a knife. I'm going to get you now. And she has her switch really ready. And I can, I would have liked to have been in the meeting when they decided this action. She runs towards Blue Demon. He steps aside. And she flies out the window. They cut to a shot. And she lands on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the big fight. And that's the end of the big boss. He didn't even have to touch her. She flew out the window <laughs> herself. Wild and wacky moments to tickle your funny bone. <laughs> you know, these movies, man, I, <laughs> I love them so much. I, I unfortunately don't allow myself to indulge in these movies as often as I should. I, I typically wait until May rolls around. It's like, okay, now which ones haven't I watched yet? But like with that Blu-ray set that came out, recently of all the Santo movies. I've, I've got a chance to kind of watch some of those just for fun. I need to watch these more on a more regular basis, man. These movies make me laugh and smile, and I get such a kick out of them. And Blue Demon in this movie is awesome! <laughs> yeah. Another thing, oh. another thing I noticed, and, and I didn't have it on my notes, but I just remembered this when you talk about Blue Demon... If you notice, when he stands next to the star, David Reynoso, mm -hmm. he looks very uh, height-challenged, <laughs> Blue Demon does. It, David Reynoso is like a foot and a half taller than he is. And I was thinking, they needed to do huh. some, they needed to do some, uh, there was a, uh, Alan Ladd was a short, famous short actor. But he was famous because they would put, they would have him on a box. If his leading lady, if he wasn't taller than the leading lady, when they talked together, he'd be on a soap, you know, a soapbox or something. So he would okay. be taller. And it seemed like it was, and Blue Demon was like, looked so short next to, to Reynoso in this film. At the same time, it's part of its charm. You know, all mm -hmm. these little mm -hmm. details that we talked about. And there's so many more that we haven't talked about. But that, and there, and it's just, it's just loaded with these little things. Sometimes they're, we would call them gaffes or mistakes. Sometimes they're brilliant moves that a director or someone is thinking about. and um, But they all add up to an entertaining package. And that's 
what I say. Like my, I do little short reviews on uh, Letterbox when I watch a movie, and my short yeah. review for this is it's uh, it's cheesy as all get out, but it's never boring. Never. It moves, and it's exciting, and it's fun, and um, has something for everybody. So seek it out, folks. Blue Demon contra las Diabolicas. Lots of good stuff. Oh, man. This really kind of helped me turn a corner on my fandom of Blue Demon because I, I've often said, and I've made it pretty clear, for me, the big three, Mel Mascaris is my guy. And Blue Demon's always been my number two, just kind of by default. Santo's great. I like Santo a lot. But I guess just kind of the way my brain is wired sometimes when it become when it comes to trying to picking out my favorites of whatever, it's hard for my brain to say, I like this guy. I don't care if everybody else likes him, too. That's my guy. And it's just a part of my brain that just doesn't want to work that way. It wants to look at the underdog or the oddball or whatever. And you ask me about my favorite Marvel comic superhero someday, guarantee you, you don't know who half of them are because I barely do. <laughs> but yeah, this is kind of how my brain is. So I know Santos is the number one and a lot of people like him, but for me, I've, he's always been kind of like the third of, of the, of the list. I love Moascaris a lot. And I am starting to question that now. Don't tell Frank Schildener. I said that watching this really put me in team blue demon, like hard. Um, there is just something magical about this movie in particular. It seems to tick off all the boxes for me. The, the fun superheroics, the music, the wrestling, some of the weird chances they take with the movie that sometimes they don't pay off, but there's some weird things they do in this movie that I, I can't, I can't see a Santo movie doing some of the weird things this movie does. I don't see Santo leaving and entering every scene through a window <laughs> jump. And mm -hmm. I don't see Mel Mascaris even having the patience to put up with that. But Blue Demon does it in this movie, and it's perfect. It just adds to this sense of of this weird reality that, oh, God, I, I love this movie. I'm starting to gush now, and I know I'm not making a lot of sense. Maybe I'll make some sense out of what I'm saying in the edit. Maybe I'll just leave my fanboying in here, but... I, I really love this. I think of all the monster movies, Luchador movies that I've talked about for Lucha de Mayo, this is easily one of my favorites. And uh, there, you reminded me of another strange, when you talk about the strange and weirdness sometimes, but it also kind of showed us a little bit of the Blue Demon's acting chops. Mm -hmm. At one mm -hmm. point in the movie, because like I mentioned before, it's actually Blue Demon that kills the first girl, the imposter, but we don't know that. Of course we know that, but we don't know that because it's part of the right. mystery. Anyways, and then the uh, the the detective, uh, Reyes, played by David Reynoso, would, went to Blue Demon after his match and talked to him and said, we found evidence that you are the one that killed this girl. And and Blue Demon gets kind of, and he says, don't you know my tri my path of the the way i've been and he, he was almost indignant you could sense that even through the mask that he was indignant at mm -hmm. the very idea that they would accuse him during the, later on in the movie and this was this was part of the mystery and it made it kind of strange and like the first time i watched it i was like well, I, I i was as confused and many times when the policemen are together trying to figure things out, they're saying, oh, I'm so confused. This is so confusing. And I was confused. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that Blue Demon was doing was he would call the policeman. He's telling them, this is what's happening. This is what they're doing. And let me tell you, Blue Demon is the uh, Blue Demon. I'm the one that killed those girls. And you're like, what? And they're like, he's basically confessing. And the girl, the uh, Anna Martin goes, that's just absurd. And he did that a couple times, kind of, and it's like, and you, and I, at first I'm like, why is he doing that? He does he want all the glory for himself? Does he trying to throw him off the track? He's telling him where to go, what to do, what the bad guys are going to do, but then he throws this thing in because he has seen the imposter and he knows, and but he's instead of saying to the policeman, you know what, there's another blue demon, there's a guy dressed like him. And that's the guy that killed the girls. I'm going to go get him. He's going to be in a wrestling match. Gonna... He doesn't say that. He says, Blue Demon. 
I'm going to, I'm the one that killed the girls. I, and, and it's like, what? And I thought, when I thought about it deeply, when he was indignant at the idea that they accused him, he held on to that throughout the movie. And that's why he did mm. that. He's like, you think I'm the one that did it? Yeah, just keep on believing that. You'll see that I wasn't the one. Yeah. You didn't trust me? You'll see. And he knew because he had seen the imposter. And when he when he got together and was in the impos- with the imposter, and how did they know which blue demons is when he, he unmasked the Im- imposter? But how did the people know? That's not, how do we know? We don't know what blue demon really looks like. How do we know that you wasn't the that. imposter? You said that in the commentary you sent me too. It's like, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. How do we really know? We're, that's part of the deal. But the, you're, you're not Mil Mascaris who actually takes his mask off every once in a while, mm-hmm. keeps his face, you know, back to the camera. But you know, Mill Mill seems to like to take his mask off, especially when there's a pretty lady around. Mm-hmm. But you know, Blue Demon doesn't do that. So mm-hmm. how do we know? Right. You know. And the thing is, and again, uh, my first couple times watching, I didn't really pick it up. But the announcer is saying. That can't be Blue Demon because he's using the illegal stranglehold, and Blue Demon doesn't yeah. do that. And right. then, and so when he took the mask off, they knew it was the real Blue Demon taking off the imposter's mask. And they said, "We know who that guy is. That guy was thrown out of wrestling because he used that very hold." So that was said amongst all the crowd noise. The announcer actually said that. So that's mm-hmm. how the people knew, and that's how we knew. Um, it might take a couple of viewings. If you're not, if you don't know Spanish, you'd never figure it out. But that's how it worked. And I, and, but, I yeah. and you reminded me of that with your talk about, you know, how, you know, Blue Demon, the uniqueness of Blue Demon, amongst the other wrestlers, and that kind, and that that kind of highlights that that little aspect where it's like, you think I actually killed those girls? I'll show you, type of attitude. Right. Throughout the right. movie, it was interesting. Well, I, I had a blast with this one. I, I've, I've been hesitant because, you know, no language track option. And we joke here on the show, we speak the international language of Lucha. Uh, in fact, when I think I'm being funny and have been looking for jobs in the past, I, I'll sometimes put on my resume that I speak Luchador. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, you know, you can enjoy these movies without knowing what's going on. But there's still those moments, like Ken was just talking about, where Blue Demon is like, oh, oh, you think it was me? Don't you know? There's this sense of, I, I don't know if it's hurt or betrayal or or extra motivation. There's something there that just really cuts deep in terms of what that character is and why Blue Demon is definitely, without a doubt, one of my favorite luchadors now. This was just a lot of fun. Um, and I'm going to say fun because I can't roll my R's. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> Divertido. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, I, I am super stoked that this is one that finally came up in the rotation for Lucha de Mayo. And uh, I cannot wait to do more Blue Demon movies in the future, man. Now you say you can't wait, but uh, well, I, what, why do I feel like it's going to be till next May again? <laughs> well, okay. And see, I was actually going to bring that up. I was going to say something about that at the end of this episode during my out- outro. Because I thought about this all day today while I was working because, okay, I think about Luchadors all the time anyway. But I was thinking about this while I was working today after watching it this morning. I love doing Lucha de Mayo. If I do more Luchador movies outside of May, does that make Lucha de Mayo lesser? Do I need to retire Lucha de Mayo and just make this a regular thing? I don't know. Uh, So listeners, I'm curious, what do you think? Is this something that do we make this the last Lucha de Mayo and we just start doing Luchador movies on the regular just because? Or do we kind of hyper-focus it all on me? I, I don't know. What, what do you think, man? I have a suggestion to, to, yeah. for the audience as well. Uh, you could, Because like Cinco de Mayo is the big holiday that Americans celebrate on, on behalf of Mexico. Mexican, <laughs> That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> yeah, Mexican, Mexicans don't really celebrate it that much it's not a big deal here but... I'm, I'm gonna say something terrible <laughs> Cinco de Mayo usually is the holiday celebrated by all the Americans who two months prior thought they were all Irish for St. Patrick's Day <laughs> yeah that's exactly so <laughs> you know, 
just to say. But and the, but uh, I think it would be qu- kind of cool if you did like on the in the middle of September, the big Mexican holiday where they celebrate being Mexican and the Mexican oh. flag and everything is their Independence Day, September sixteenth. So if you do it something in that weekend or that close to that date, fifteenth, sixteenth, that would be something that even could be used to promote it and maybe get some, you know, uh, some Mexican listeners, you know, Hey, we're doing something for independence day. And that would be, okay. that'd be something that, uh, you know, to, and then uh, kind of balance cause you're talking the fifth month and the ninth month. So you kind of got a little balance there and maybe have a couple day, a couple of episodes of Mexican movies at that time. Cause that's a okay. big, big, uh, that's the big Mexican holiday in Mexico. The Interesting. Dia de Independencia, okay. 16th of September. Okay. So, just an idea. If you want to have more Mexican stuff, and there are so many movies, <laughs> I say it in my segment that I sent. But the 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 articles that I'm using <clears throat> are actually older than the ones I've used before. I feel like I did this before, but I could not find a record of it or a, a recording of it. So I'm redoing it from uh, 1964. Uh, issues 29 and 31 famous monsters and there was a two-part article and there was like a list of movies uh, there's there's close to a hundred monster fantasy movies in 1964 so you know they just kept making them up through the mid 80s wow. they were making luchador movies so um you know there's a never-ending fountain of Mexican monster movies out there. I don't huh. know how easy they are to find, but they're out there. <laughs> so I've got on, I have a hard drive, a server here with a ton of my movies on it. And I've got like 80 different luchador movies on here. <laughs> wow. uh, a lot, and, and not all of them are, you know, monster stuff. Some of it's, mm. you know, blue demon fights, fights the Chinese mafia. I, which I, I want to watch. That's the next one on my list that I want to watch just for fun. I'm fascinated mm-hmm. by the idea of Blue Demon and Chinese mobsters. I don't know why. I just think it sounds cool, and I want to see it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Be um, for uh, non-PC racism happening. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm I am I am well aware. <laughs> just just don't. Just make a point of not watching it after you've watched all the Fu Manchu movies or something. You know, just <laughs> well, I've you been, need that palate cleanser. <laughs> I've been going through uh, Leonard Maltin's book and and looking for all the three star. I've seen all the four star movies, most of the three and a half star movies. Now I'm going through three star movies, and there's so much available on the internet somewhere. I just mm-hmm. go through and I say, I wonder if this movie's and it is. And so I'm just going alphabetically so i just went through all the three star charlie chan movies so oh <laughs> and then you have yeah. then you have the charlie chan uh where was he at charlie chan in egypt which featured step and fetch it so that was interesting Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. yeah that's a thing oh boy at least the son was a real Chinese person. <laughs> yeah, good point. Good point. All right. Well, before we wrap up, uh, I do want to play a round of the Classic Five card game with please, Kenny. Please, please, please. And the uh, Classic Five. Uh, all right. Classic so the Classic Five. five. Tra- <laughs> <laughs> it's traditionally a card game where I've got a deck of cards here. Each one of these cards has a this or that. Which movie do you prefer? Style question on them. There are no wrong answers. It's just a way to get monster kids talking about. My favorite topic, monster movies. Except this time around, this month, in honor of Lucha de Mayo, I have kind of tweaked some of the questions here. And while I did ask Robert Kelly last week these questions as well, Kenny hasn't heard them yet, so they're still new to him. (laughs) We're going to do some luchador-flavored classic five cards this time around. Kenny, are you ready to play? I'm ready to play. Or let's see, it's a Classico Cinco? Is that that right? And the better cinco, cl- el cinco clásico. See, I'm Los such a cinco white guy. Clásicos. Los cinco clásicos. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, just, yeah. just forgive my gringo You have to, you have to um, switch the ad, adjective and the noun. They go backwards. Gotcha. Gotcha. 
All right. Well, uh, we're just going to dive into some of this then. So first question for you, sir. The Luchadors fought a lot of monsters. What's a classic monster movie monster that they didn't fight that you'd like to see him fight? You know would be cool? Hmm. The Emir. When he was, when Ooh. he, before he gets giant. Oh, man, that'd be dope. Oh, that'd be cool. Or even a, a, a Harryhausen skeleton wrestling match. <laughs> Excellent. I like that a lot. Oh, wow, that's good. That's real good. All right, all right, let's do a second question here. Uh, again, luchador flavored. What classic monster movie monster would you like to see in a wrestling ring? I'd like to see Oliver Reed's Werewolf from Curse of the Werewolf. Coolest werewolf okay. out there. And he's just brutal shirt ripping. That'd just be perfect. I like it. All right, question number three. Of all the Luchador monster movies, and you've seen a lot of them, what would be your go-to movie if you were trying to introduce somebody to this really fun subgenre of cinema. What's your go-to movie to show them? I, I'm going to, I'm going to go with my favorite and it's uh Santo versus the Martian invasion mm. is I'm going to be honest. I have not, I, you've probably seen more than I have. I, I, I there's, I haven't, you know, I've, I've been kind of like you. I watch them when I'm supposed to do them for you, you know, type of thing. And there, and there, but that movie, I did a dub of it for Monster Bash. Oh, that's right. And to, in order to do that, I I watched that thing probably fifty times, if not a hundred. I mean, it was, and it, and I learned something about myself and about movie watching in general. The more you watch something, you think you'd get tired of it. That thing grew on me so much, and I have such a love and a knowledge of that movie because of the amount of times I've watched it. To me, to show someone else it, I think it would be easier for me to transmit my love for that particular movie and interest in 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 uh, luchador movies in general, because I could just really share that with them. And because there, there's, I I got that thing memorized back and forth and left and right, and okay. um, and and it never got boring. It never wore out on me. It's never like, oh, do I have to do this again? You know, I'd go back and I'd watch it. You know, I'm going to tweak this. And I'd go back and, you know, switch something around or do something and watch it again. And, you know, I, want, I wanted it to be as be as good as it could be. And and the, and in the to do the translation, it was like, you know, I'd watch it. And then there were some places where it's like, I, I'm not getting it. And I'd, Juana, Candy, come here. What are they saying? What are they saying? And it was like, I was just, I just really dug into that movie. And and it just, but at the same time, fell in love with it. So, and it would be easier, easiest, the easiest movie for me to share with somebody, and 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 foment that love and give that love to them. It's a really good answer, and uh, I think it helps if the mo movie is good to begin with and enjoyable to begin with. But like when we did Plan Nine from Outer Space, and just really kind of dove into it over and over and over again, and like that movie and. I mean, there are certain movies that I obsess over that, by all rights, I shouldn't. But, you know, I do have an Argo Man-themed dining room, for crying out loud. So, you know, I <laughs> the more you kind of dig into it and watch it and experience more and more and more about it. So, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I dig that. We got some icons. You know, Karloff, Lugosi, Agar, all of them. What classic monster movie icon would you like to see in a luchador film? I think it would be cool. If we had like Peter Cushing as a mad doctor in, in one of them, bring some British class to the lowbrow Mexican movie. Oh, I love that. I thought about Lon Chaney, but he did some Mexican movies and John Carradine and some of our classics already did some. But I think it would have been cool to have like, uh, like have a British feel to it, bring in a British uh person and have some sort of uh english thing either you know santo and blue demon go to london or mm -hmm. well like that or, too. or dr frankenstein invades mexico city or something like that so that, that would be that would be cool for blue demon and santo to go to 60s london with all the mop heads and the beatles music and all that 
the crazy mod style and and battle British hammer monsters with Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee thrown in there somewhere and and just, you know, do a hammer Mexican mashup like I did a hair uh uh luchador uh Harryhausen mashup. We could do a hammer luchador mashup. That would be fun. That'd be so much fun. And it would be, a, and we'd have like the comedy would be them trying to make themselves understood and not understanding, and <laughs> them learning some English and all the English girls learning a little bit of Spanish. And <laughs> oh, perfect! I love that. I love that. <laughs> Throw in some Caroline oh, Monroe, yeah. some Veronica Carlson, and oh, all the dude. classics. <laughs> some Martin, oh, man. some Martin Beeswood could be one of the bad girls, you know. <laughs> That'd be amazing. They could get in the ring. Of course, they'd wear masks and have uh, stunt wrestlers. <laughs> yeah, they, they did that with all the women in those movies, man. I don't understand. Well, I mean, I guess, I don't know. Anyway. All right, final question. Could you make a luchador kaiju film work? And if so, who would be in it? Yes, I think it would be. Uh, <clears throat> this is what I would do. It would be the third part of Pacific Rim. <laughs> okay, and you'd have uh, the the people who were you know running the robots are realizing we're a bunch of engineers and and g gamers and stuff. We just don't know how to really fight. We are not having the success that we had at the beginning. We need someone that can really fight. You get two Jaguar type, you know, those the robotic monsters that they had, the kaiju that they had, and the, and and you put in the three, the classic three: Blue Demon, uh, Santo, Mil Mascaris. You know, and it'd be and the, the part of the fun of the movie and the, some comic relief would be them training and this is how it works and this and that and all that. <laughs> and oh then, man! And then you let you give you suit them up and let them do a wrestling fight. I want to see a luchador Mac giving a pile driver to a kaiju. That's all. That's that's what I want to see. I I didn't know I wanted to see it until now. The only I want to see that. <laughs> the only thing is, I, I'm not sure how wh what they could do. So there would be some way to have ropes so they can bounce off the ropes and somewhere Ooh, and, yeah. and something to jump off of, like a turnbuckle or something, because that's a famous move for Mexican wrestlers is jumping off the top turnbuckle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So there'd have to be they, uh, that could be easy where you'd have like they could be either buildings or in a, in a valley or a cavern, you know, in a where there's mountains and stuff, or they could do something where, um, but with the rope thing to be able to bounce off something, that would be harder would you to do pull that? off. Yeah. yeah. Or they could do something where, ah, oh, here's how, here's how we make it work. Okay. So okay. the same engineers, they set it up and they've, they push the monsters into like a desert place, a deserted place. And they have a, they have like a ring with, like laser ropes and they're like, but they, they don't hurt the person. They don't hurt the robot. The robot can bounce off them. Okay. And so it'd be, they'd actually be ring wrestling in the middle of like a desert, but they, the engineers would set it up realizing we okay. have to set it up so that they are familiar with their surroundings, the wrestlers. So we're going to have a, a ring. So then part of the movie would be them pushing the monster to come out and be in the ring. And then they okay. do actually ring wrestling, like a tag team match in the middle of the desert. Oh. <laughs> oh, man. I'm I'm so in for this. I mean, you're saying middle of the desert. My brain's immediately going to things like, you know, Destroy All Monsters or even the Gamera movie. Set them up on the moon. Just sit <laughs> it somewhere. Uh, Call uh, Guillermo de Toro. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh man well kenny thanks for doing this today this has been a lot of fun um i i've been enjoying setting up recording sessions for right when i get off work but it makes the work day that much longer 
because I really look forward to hanging out with my friends after work and talking about this stuff. And it's been way too long since we've had a chance to chat. So thank you for doing this. It's been a blast. And, uh, just Yeah, just thanks for being part of the Monster Kid Radio crew, family, gang, unit. I don't know. We need a name. Radio heads. There we go. <laughs> thank you for being a Monster Kid Radio head. There we go. <laughs> All right, well, that's the end of the show. So as I was kind of discussing with Kenny, and I ended up trimming some of this conversation because it really did get kind of, you know, behind the curtain kind of stuff. And, and y'all don't really need to hear any of that. But the bottom line is, is that we may be changing how we do Lucha de Maya here in the future on Monster Kid Radio. Lucha de Maya may actually end because I love these movies so much. Why am I sequestering them only sequestering them? Is that the word? Why am I making him sit in the May section of the... That's not even the best way to put it either. Why am I celebrating them only in May? I mean, I like having the gimmick of having May be the thing, but these movies are so good. I have such a good time watching them. I have an even better time discussing them. I'd like to do it more often. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens in the future. You know, Kenny had some great ideas as well. I'd love to hear your feedback on that. If you have any feedback about anything that Kenny said anything I said, anything Mark said in the Beta Capsule Review, or anything that you've heard here on the show in the past, please give us a call like this. You can call and leave a voicemail for Monster Kid Radio at 503-810-5MKR. That's 503-810-5657. Or you can send an email to the podcast. MonsterKidRadio at gmail.com is the email address. That's monsterkidradio at gmail.com. Of course, that contact information is on our website over monsterkidradio.net. You're also going to find links to our Facebook page, our Facebook group, our Twitter, our Reddit, our Discord, our Patreon, our Twitch, our Tee Public Shop, my Amazon wish list, maybe even my. I don't know where I was going with that. There's a joke in there somewhere that I am just losing the thread of, and I don't have the excuse of having been hit over the head at all, <laughs> let alone many times, to be drawing a blank here. I, you know what it is? It's 12.26 a.m. Friday morning, and I just want to get this episode out because I'm tired of making people wait until the day of the actual movie stream on Twitch to get the new episode of the podcast. So I just want to get this out there. Speaking of which, if you are available on Saturday at 11 a.m. Pacific, where the pre-show starts, where noon the movies are starting, at our Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash Monster Kid Radio. We're showing Mexican monster movies in the Monster Kid Movie Club. It's free to watch. They are ad supported. That's something that Twitch does. I don't have any control over the ads. Although, you have control over the ads if you subscribe to the Twitch channel. It's only $5 a month. That helps me out a little bit here on Monster Kid Radio. But again, you can watch them for free nonetheless. And there's a live chat going. I can tell you we're watching Samson and is it the Wax Museum. I believe that's the one we're watching as well as The Skeleton of Mrs. Morales and uh, The Man and the Monster, which Kenny talked about earlier in the Famous Monsters of Filmland segment. We'll have some other fun stuff as well, and yeah, it's going to be a good time. What's coming up next week on the show? Not 100% sure. I've got a couple of feelers out about who can do the final week of Lucha de Mayo here on Monster Kid Radio. Uh, it will be a Luchador movie of some sort, more than likely a Santo film. But again, I've been kind of trying to work out some details and, and get that lined up. So stay tuned for that. And then that is the end of Lucha de Mayo 2022, which means we've got to look ahead to June, where we're going to be talking about the movie The Legend of Hell House in two weeks with Alistair Hughes. And then the week after that, uh, something else is kind of in the works I need to work out the details of. But bottom line is, Monster Kid Radio's firing on all cylinders, man. And I am stoked for what the future has to bring. Until that future hits, so remember that Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, non commercial, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. Of course, it doesn't apply. To the song Nightshade. That is copyright 2022, The Delstroyers. You can find them over at thedelstroyers.bandcamp.com. Check them out. Check out this album. Check out their previous releases. Check out their tour dates and let them know that Monster Kid Radio sent you. My name is Derek Kim Cook. I'll talk to everybody next week when we're going to have even more Divertido. Adios. <laughs>